Hello, good morning. Um, so I'm glad for, for everyone who could be here. It's, uh, it's a privilege to get up and preach again. Uh, I don't get to do it too often, but uh, I think they're having a celebration down there for their anniversary, so it's good to be able to fill in when we can. Um, so uh, today's Bible reading, of course, was Psalm 37, and the title for today's sermon is called Pride, the Faith Killer. So Pride, the Faith Killer. Now, the purposes uh, of today's sermon is to define faith. Um, it's also to shore up our faith um, and also to show how pride can destroy your faith, uh, both in regarding to salvation, as in you can't believe the gospel, but also how it's important that we have complete faith in God in everything that we do after we're saved as well. So, because we are commanded to walk in faith. Um, so, to define faith, we'll look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Um, but even the dictionary is right in the definition of faith. So the first definition in the dictionary is confidence or trust in a person or thing. So, and that's the same, exact same definition that the Bible uses. So we don't define the Bible with dictionaries, but uh, I'm just going to be showing today that the Bible uses the same definition of faith um, as, the, as the dictionary, um, which is to have trust or confidence in a person, a confident expectation of relying and trusting in something. Hope and faith are interchangeable in that context, as is confidence and trust. So you can use any of those words to describe faith. If you want to turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. So the first thing we're going to look at is our confidence in the promises of God. And there's going to be a lot of contrasting against, against pride. Um, but in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we, th we through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. So we see there that hope of righteousness. And uh, so you can see the contrast with the unsaved is they're trusting in their circumcision or they're trusting in their flesh, they're trusting in their works, uh, where it says our hope, we have the hope of righteousness by faith. And that's not saying that, well, I hope I'm saved, you know, I'm hoping that I have righteousness. Like, no, that actually is a, uh, a confident expectation that my hope is in the righteousness of Christ. And it's a promise, it's a certainty that Christ has imputed unto us his righteousness. And you can find hundreds of verses in the New Testament that say that. Um, so I'm not crossing my fingers hoping the Lord will save me, but I have a confident expectation. My hope is in his righteousness. And I have a hope in that. And we'll see how important that is shortly. But he's also said he's, he saved my soul, and it's a certainty that I will receive a body in his likeness, that I'll receive a new body. 1 Corinthians 15, again, a great chapter. You know, we've read through that a lot recently as well, and Pastor expanded on that recently. But we receive a new heavenly body when we, you know, those who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will be changed in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. But for those who do pass before then and go to sleep, they'll receive their new body on that day as well. And that's what faith is. According to Hebrews 11, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So that evidence of things not seen. I'm as sure of the promises in the King James Bible as I am, you know, standing here right now. I know I'm standing here right now, but I'm more confident in those promises. Uh, in Hebrews 3.14, it says, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. See, our, steadfast, uh, our confidence isn't in the flesh. Our trust and faith is in Christ for and after salvation. So that faith in Hebrews 11 says to mean have confidence in the Lord, to trust that he's declared unto us even though it's not seen. And this is salvation. We didn't see Christ crucified, but John bear him witness. So if you want to turn to 1 John chapter 5. And that's the thing, is it's, it's about what's not seen. So you can see something, like you can see the car I'm driving and you don't have to believe I drive that car because you've seen it. But if I tell you that's the car I'm driving and you haven't seen it, then believing is you trusting that that's true. And that's what believing is. Now, I haven't seen Christ crucified, but John did, and he testified of it. So in 1 John 5, 5, it says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? He that came by water and blood, 
even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for there is one witness of God, which he testifieth of, for, the, for, sorry, for this is the witness of God, which he testifieth of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and his life is in his Son. Now in John chapter 19, verse 34, this is, a, this is the event that John's speaking about. It said, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. So that disciple John, that's the one, you know, he calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved. Now he testified of the spirit, the water, and the blood because he was a witness to all those things. And the word prophesied of the Spirit, the water, and the blood. We also haven't seen the Father, but the Son has declared him. So again, we know God the Father exists because the, the Son has declared him who the Father is. He's declared everything about the Father and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we can understand who the Father is by looking at Christ, the Son. And I trust the record of God, which he left us in the book, the King James Bible, I believe the record the Son, Jesus Christ, gave of our Father in heaven. And again, I know it to be more true than anything I can see or touch or feel. And that's what faith is. That's what hope is. Um, I'll get you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Because Peter explains this very thing as well. So in 1 Peter 1 verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see that word hope again. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious of gold than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And look at verse 8 and 9. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. I mean, I just love that. See, we haven't seen Christ. Um, we haven't seen an image of Christ. We haven't seen anything. And, you know, that's why it was a good sermon last week on, on images, on, uh, you know, on idols. Because we don't have an image of Christ. We don't worship an image. We worship a living God. And so we haven't seen him, but we know of him. And we still can rejoice with joy unspeakable about that. And verse 17, it says, And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. We'll see this again shortly about how important fear is as well in walking in faith. In verse 18, For as much as you know you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and your hope might be in God. See, believing, trusting, having faith in God, that will bring you unspeakable joy. And it's not just the fact that I know I'll never see death, I'll never see hell. You know, that itself brings some joy. But as he works in our lives to sanctify us, to conform us to the image of his son, I mean, that also brings joy. That brings great joy to us where we can walk in righteousness and know that we're walking in the light with God and we receive the blessings of God. But we see pride is something, and it's, it's different, but it's not entirely different from faith. See, pride is relying and trusting in someone, but it's trusting in yourself. 
It's directed at yourself. See, pride is a perversion of faith. It's faith misplaced. Faith is trusting in another. It's having confidence in another. It's, uh, it's believing in another. But pride is having confidence in yourself, trusting in yourself and believing in yourself. So first I want to show you some verses on, on hope, which will help define what hope is and how hope and trust and faith all do mean the same thing in this context. Uh, Titus 1.1 1, 1. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So again, we see in hope of eternal life. Now, the world uses a common definition, which is, you know, well, it's not a confident expectation. It's like a maybe, you know, well, I hope that happens. I hope you know, I get a pay rise, or, you know, I don't know, it's not a confident expectation, but in here it is a confident expectation. This is the, the definition the Bible uses most often in regards to hope. It's, my hope is in eternal life, which God cannot lie. So it's not like there's a maybe, there is no maybe, I am saved, I have eternal life. There's no maybe about it. And so that's the definition the Bible uses, it's a complete trusting, a confident expectation, and it fits in with with the definition of faith, having a confident expectation in another. And there is complete confidence in the promise of eternal life. But you also, when you read the Bible, you need to make sure you get context when you're looking at words like faith and hope. But in general, the terms are interchangeable and hope means a confident expectation. So in Hebrews uh, chapter 6, if you want to turn to Luke chapter 18, in Hebrews chapter 6, 17, it says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil." Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So our hope is in knowing that God cannot lie and the promises he confirmed with an oath, which is that we are the children of promise, we will receive eternal life. And it says that our hope is an anchor for the soul and it's steadfast and cannot move. In verse 18 it says we flee for refuge to that hope. So we cling to it, we cleave to it. And that gives us peace. That's what gives us that joy unspeakable. And th that's the thing is I've made my peace with the Father in heaven. I've made my peace with the maker of this world. And I know that because I've made that peace through his son, not through anything I've done, but it's through his son and his sacrifice. And that's why we're so confident of eternal life. It's because of hope. It's because of faith. And it's why we boldly preach to others that they can have the same confidence in the promises of God. See, we chose to believe, and now we not only believe, but we know for sure we have hope in Christ. And we have faith in his salvation. So I just want to consider when, when reading verses about faith, so maybe substitute trust, hope, confidence, um, and, and see if that helps your understanding, because that really did help mine. So I do want to move on to the aspect of pride next. So if you did turn to Luke chapter 18, um, I just want to show that impact that pride can have on your ability to have faith in God. So we're familiar with the story of the rich ruler in uh, Luke chapter 18. So this is a proud man. He met with God. And there's one thing we notice here is the Lord did not clearly reveal himself to this man. So in Luke 18, 18, it says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, and that's God. Thou knowest his commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour thy father and mother. And the man, and he said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. So we see first here, this is the pride. He's trusting in his works. He's trusting in his flesh. He's trusting in himself. In verse 22, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. 
And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. So we see the second pride, second uh, form of pride here for the rich ruler is also trusting in his riches. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? See, Jesus knew he wasn't going to believe. He knew he didn't trust in him. He knew he was trusting in his riches and in, his, in the works of his hands. So he didn't reveal himself as the Messiah to this man. And we'll see later on that there is someone he did reveal to himself as the Messiah to. And it's those who were humble. But this is the thing, he calls Jesus good master, so he recognises he's good. But when Jesus says there's none good but one and that's God, he doesn't recognise him as God. But what he does is he lifts himself up to the same level as Christ. He's making himself a God in his own mind. And that's, that's just so prideful. But there are so many we see today who do that. If you're trusting in, your com- in the commandments and in your riches, like he was, believing that's enough, that's why he went away sorrowful. He didn't have joy and peace because he didn't make peace with the maker. He went away sorrowful because he's trusting in his riches and he knew he couldn't give those up. And that's what pride does in someone's heart. It stops them from being able to trust in someone else. And everyone who believes in work salvation is out there like this. Every false religion is like this. They're trusting in themselves and their works and they fall short. As the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Psalm 49, verse 6, is they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever. That he should live forever and not see corruption. See, a rich man trusting in his wealth like this rich ruler, he couldn't buy salvation for himself, couldn't buy salvation for his friends or anyone else. It says, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and that means it requires a precious payment. See, silver and gold can't pay for a precious thing, neither can the blood of bulls and goats. But the, the only thing that was considered precious by God, and the one payment that will only ever be accepted, that's the precious blood of Jesus Christ once for all. So if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, I'll read to you from Psalm forty-nine, fifteen. It says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house has increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. He shall never see light. Man that is in honour and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. And Pastor Kevin already expanded on this last week, so I'm not going to go through it again. But it's, it, money can't redeem your soul. All your friends, all your families, regardless of what the Catholic Church teaches, you know, God will redeem your soul if you've trusted in him. And how's he going to do that? As it said in 1 Peter 19, by the pre- precious blood of Christ. And as he says in Hebrews, which we're about to read, it's by the body prepared for the Son to be that sacrifice for sins. So you're in Hebrews 10, look at verse 6. It says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. So he's talking about the Old Testament covenant where they were commanded to to shed the blood of bulls and goats for sin, but that was never going to save their souls. That was only to, to spare them from judgment before the Father. That's to have them forgiven for the sins on this earth. But eternal life was always by faith, always by trusting in, in the Lord, whatever name they knew him by. But that's, you know, makes it clear here. In burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin, thou had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering. An offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we are, we, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So again, we see the Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. Everyone was saved the same way. It was never by the sin, by, you never had your sins remitted by uh, the law, 
by the, even by the sacrifices of the, of the old covenant. That was something they had to do to dwell in the land, but that was nothing to do with their salvation. It was always by trusting in the Lord. It was always looking forward to Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that was pleasing to the Father. And that's how God redeemed our souls. It's not with the filthy gold and silver of this world. It's not with works either, because he says they're filthy rags. And the Apostle Paul, when he speaks about his works, he says, well, I can't them all but dung. That's not going to save you. That's not a precious payment. God's not going to accept that. But the debt we owe is paid freely by Jesus Christ, and it's been paid entirely by his sacrifice, if we trust in him and his sacrifice. See, it takes humility to have faith in someone else. In Matthew 5, of course, we've got the Beatitudes, and we are pretty familiar with them, but he speaks of the humble and contrite in heart. So I'll just read you a few verses. You can turn there if you like. But Matthew 5, verse 2, says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's your, that's your humble person. That's someone who's not lifted up and haughty. You've got blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In, in Psalm 37, verse 11, it says, But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Again, why, why do we have an abundance of peace? Because through humility, we believed on the Lord and reconciled ourselves with the Father through the Son. In verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in Psalm 51, verse 16, it says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. So the Lord loves it when we're humble. But salvation has to come through humility. It doesn't come through proud boasting. And even if you're boasting in yourself after you've believed and are saved, you're still not walking by faith. But we should glory in the Lord and what he's done. We should boast of Christ and his works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 again, one of our soul winning verses, says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And this is the thing, no man can boast before God. Nobody. It's just complete foolishness and vanity. See, we boast in God's wonderful works. And if you do want inspiration on what you can boast about as far as God's works are, then you can read through the, the Psalms. There are many psalms that praise the works of God. And that's a great way that you can do that. But that's the thing, like especially to the rich ruler. Jesus didn't make a point to convince those who were prideful and not humbly accepting their need for a saviour. He didn't correct the rich young ruler and he went away sorrowful. His sins not being saved, remitted. And he's on his way to hell. I mean, hopefully he got right after that. He might have thought about it and got right, but it's doubtful uh, because he was trusting in his riches. And Paul and Barnabas also did the same thing in Acts chapter 13. Act, Acts 13, 45 says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. See, some people, especially those who are determined to trust in themselves and their works, they've judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. And there's nothing you can do about that. See, without faith, without trusting in Jesus, there is no salvation. And we see one group who's, you know, who is the most unworthy of eternal life of course, that's the LGBT sodomite filth that we see. They're reprobate, rejected by God. And who is more proud than they? So we, of course, know Romans 1. So feel free to turn there or not. But it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
See, this is what we glory in. We glory in the gospel of Christ. We glory in the righteousness of God revealed unto us. But we're going to look now what they glory in. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So that's the thing. Then they're not without excuse. You know, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things, so idols. See, they knew God, but they despised him. They corrupted the word and the righteousness that was shown under them. And this is why that God gives them over to a reprobate mind to become the filthy beasts, you know, so that it's obvious to us who hates God. It reveals his wrath on the unrighteous and the wicked. So we also can glory in the wrath and judgment of God because that's a righteous part of God. That's who he is. And that is a very important part of who he is. But what are the characteristics by which we can know who they are? So it says even in verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave, gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable. Now, to say that's a bad list is such an understatement. But the thing about reprobates is they're irredeemable. Not, not only do they have no redeemable characteristics as far as just society and humanity goes, but their mind is so blinded, even the Lord himself will not redeem them. They cannot believe, and their pride blinds them, as does their hatred of God. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, it says this, Now also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Again, pride. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good. That's despising us and despising God. They are traitors. They are heady, high-minded. High-minded is also pride. They're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And having a form of godliness, but denying the power of God from such turn away. So they can even pretend and call themselves a brother in Christ. But these are, these are complete reprobate concerning the faith. And they're lifted up with pride. I'll get you to turn to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 4. But they're lifted up with pride. And we need to be careful as well, because we can also be lifted up with pride. We can get heady, high-minded... Um, as well, and think better of ourselves than we ought to. You know, otherwise there wouldn't be warnings there for us to, to worry about such things. In Proverbs 16, verse 4, it says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord... Men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And better is a little, right, a little with righteousness than a great revenues without right. Again, what point is money if you're unrighteous? It does you no good. So again, we're not to chase after money, but rather we're to seek righteousness. In Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find? See, boasting of yourself is pride. We're saved through grace, through, by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. See, to walk by faith is to do everything for the Lord, glorifying him by the work of your hands and with your lips, not boasting in yourself, which is the natural state of man. 
Proverbs 27 verse 2 says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. So you want, we want to be praised of the Lord. We want him to say we've done well. We don't want to be saying that of ourselves. You know, the Lord determines how well we're doing. It's not up to us. And we shouldn't be boasting in that. Rather, boast in his great works, everything that he's done for you. Proverbs 15.33 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honour is humility. So if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 3. But the world will teach you, exalting yourself brings honour. But the scripture actually teaches the opposite, as, as is many cases with the world's wisdom. The scripture teaches the exact opposite. See, pride doesn't bring honour, it brings foolishness. It brings vanity. Um, whereas humility is living by faith. It's praising the Lord and it brings honour from God when you abase yourself and exalt him as others before you. And that's also what charity is. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, Faith, hope, charity, these three, the greatest of these is charity. And what charity is, it's just love, but love for somebody else. So showing love to somebody else is charity. Whereas you can love yourself, but charity is loving somebody else and showing love to someone else. And in Philippians 2 verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Whereof God, hath all, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above which, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, of things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, this is Jesus, the Son of God, who is God. He lowered himself, lower than the angels. He made himself a man and a servant. So he showed us an example of humility that I doubt any of us could reach. But it's something we should certainly strive for. See, to esteem others better than ourselves, to be servants of God's people here on earth, you know, and earning heavenly rewards for doing so, that's, that was the heart of Christ. That's the mind of Christ. That's what we should be doing here. And Christ even said of John the Baptist, there's none born a woman greater than he, but said even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Um, but what did John say about himself? I'm paraphrasing, but he said he couldn't even sh you know, tie the Lord's shoelaces. He wasn't even worthy to tie the Lord's shoelaces. And yet he abased himself and the Lord exalted him by saying there's none born among, among women on this earth who are greater than he. But, uh, you know, again, it's even better, though, to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But humility is the key to walking in faith and trusting in the Lord in all things. If you want to, uh, you can turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. See, I'll read to you from Proverbs 22, 4. It says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honour and life. In Galatians 6.14 it says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. See, when it comes to pride, it's wanting to justify yourself, even before God. Sorry, excuse me. So pride is wanting to justify yourself before God. But we don't glory in the things of this world. You know, we don't receive the glory of this world. It says, I'm crucified to the world and the world unto me. So what that means is, I'm dead to the world and the world is dead to me. See, I don't seek reward in this world. I don't seek glory in this world. I seek my reward for the works in Christ, in, in glory, you know, for Christ who lives forevermore. Like, I know I have an eternity in heaven. I know that everything I do on this earth for the Lord is going to get me riches in heaven. So if we work towards that, and that's where, we're, where our eyes are set upon, 
then that's not only pleasing to the Lord, but that's the thing. That's, you know, the world is dead to me. We, earthly rewards mean nothing to us. We know they're eventually going to be burnt up. There is no reason for us to, to strive to, enter, to, to earn rewards here, knowing that we can earn rewards of the Lord. So in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To, dare, to declare, I say, at this time his, right, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By law, what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. There we, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So you want to be justified before God? There's only one way. It's by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not by the law of faith. It's excluded from that. There is no boasting in the law. There's only boasting in your faith in Christ and what he's done. And there's another thing I noticed as well while studying for this sermon is how many times that trusting and fearing the Lord were correlated. And it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot more than I could ever include in this sermon as long as it is. Um, but yeah, like uh, his judgment, his laws, his commandments, you know, fearing the Lord, trusting in him, it, it just goes hand in hand. And it goes back to Brother Jason's stream, uh, sermon as well uh, about walking in the light that he did last week. So if you're trusting in the Lord, you will fear him and keep his commandments, walking in the light with him, and all of that's accomplished in the new man, walking in the spirit. So we see even Abraham in Romans chapter 4, if you want to turn over the page, 4 verse 1, it says, What shall we say that Abraham and our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See, even Abraham, such a great man of God, as great as he was, he was not justified before God by his works. Not at any time. But his faith was counted for righteousness. See, he trusted in the Lord, and that's how he was justified. And that's how anyone's been justified before God. That's how we received eternal life. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of Christ. See, that was the pride of Israel. They did not submit themselves to the righteousness of Christ, but through pride they made their own righteousness, which is of the law. And that was by the works of their own hands. In verse 4, it continues, Romans 10, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who hath ascended into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. And that's what we glory in. And this is, sorry, this is that word of faith, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Again, there's no question there. That's a, that's, you know, that's a confident expectation. Thou shalt be saved. Again, that's what I, I bank on. That's what I rely on. It says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. See, they just wouldn't submit to Christ's righteousness. And faith requires humility 
to put your trust in somebody else. In this case, that's trusting in God. That's trusting in the Son of God who died and paid for all your sins. And that's where the nation of Israel failed. But that's where everyone who trusts in the works for work salvation also fails. That's where that repenting your sins crowd, you know, they failed to attain the righteousness of Christ, but rather set about their own righteousness and have their own Jesus, which is not the Jesus of the Bible. See, and we see that later on the nation of Israel as well. They mixed it not with faith, which is why many trusted in their genealogies, saying of they have Abraham to their father, which was not the case. You know, because Christ said, even of these stones, I'm able to raise up children of Abraham. The genealogy didn't matter. It doesn't matter today. They were trusting in their circumcision, trusting even some people in baptism or their church attendance or their giving of alms or whatever. They're trusting in some false god, another Jesus. They're not trusting in the Jesus, the Son of God, who came down from heaven and paid with his own blood. Because that's the only way you can get remission of sins. In Ephesians 1.11, it says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom he also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of his glory. Again, it's to the praise of his glory. It's not glorying in your own works. It's not glorying in your own, you know, the works of your own hands, but it's glorying it's the praise of his glory. God's the one who gets the glory. Christ is the one who gets the glory for our salvation. So that, that finishes the... Uh, I'll just read from Obadiah, but then that'll finish the, uh, the portion on, on pride. Um, Obadiah 1.3 says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So again, if you exalt yourself, the Lord will bring you down. If you abase yourself, the Lord will lift you up. So it's, it's the complete opposite of what the world teaches you, but that's how God works. Once you understand that, you can have a better, you know, a better relationship with God as you walk in his ways and you do things according to his will. So we're going to, if you want to turn to John chapter 4, verse 21, we finish that comparison of pride versus humility. And we'll look at that uh, uh, story of the Samaritan woman at the well. So this woman, she was humble as compared to the rich ruler. And the Lord reflected her humility back to her. And this is where he revealed himself to be the Messiah. And she walks away justified. In John 4, 21, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. For we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He couldn't have been more clear about who he was. He said, look, that Messiah? Yeah, that's me. Whereas to the rich ruler, he said, oh, well, if you're you're as good as I am, if you're God, then just sell all you have and come with me. Like he he didn't correct him. But with this woman, he reveals himself as the Messiah. He says, yeah, I'm I'm the Messiah. Because he knows that she's humble and she wants to trust in him. It said, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? So you can see the difference in the heart between those two people, how the Lord actually reflected their heart upon them. So to the proud, he didn't reveal himself. But to the humble, he showed himself plainly as the Messiah. If you want to know, like if you're, obviously we're all saved here, but before I was saved, I was looking for God, but unable to find him. But I don't believe I was seeking him with humility until the day he brought his truth to me and I believed it. 
Because if you are seeking him with humility, the Lord will reveal himself to you. He will send a prophet to you and he will get you the gospel. Because the Lord's not willing that any should perish. So he's not going to leave you out there wanting to know who he is and not send anybody. But, he, but you do need to be humble enough to receive it. And I had to go through some horrific things in my life to humble me to a point where I could actually believe the gospel. Some people are like that. Some people, you know, can be too proud to, to receive it. And, you know, having humility, being humbled, it's God knows we're going to believe at some point. So he can bring things across your path that make life difficult for you, to humble you, so you get to a point where you can actually trust in somebody other than yourself. And so that's a good prayer to pray for somebody as well. If you know someone who's very proud and they resist the gospel, just pray, you can pray for bad things to happen to them, to humble them, to bring them to a point where they might be humble enough to receive the word of God and to trust in somebody else. There's another story here of Mark, in Mark chapter 7, verse 26. It says, The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus saith unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it under the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and the daughter laid upon the bed. So that's just another story of someone who had faith in the Lord. And even though Jesus tries to dismiss her, she persists, knowing that he's able to save her daughter. And not only that, but she was humble. She didn't come to him and say, well, no, you have to do this. She's like, no, look, we just want the crumbs, whatever's left. Just give me something. You know, and he saw the humility and said, for this saying, go thy way. And it doesn't, see, for salvation, it doesn't take much faith either. I was preaching to a, a young woman one time, and when I told her that all she needs to do to receive eternal life is to have faith and trust in the Lord who died for her, she said, but I don't have much faith. I don't think I have enough faith. And so I explained to her, it doesn't matter how, much or how little you have, it's only about where you place it. See, faith is trusting in the Lord, whereas pride is trusting in yourself. So as long as you, whatever faith you have, you put it all on the Lord, then that's salvation. That's, you'll receive eternal life. God just wants all of it. He doesn't care how little or how much he's given you because he knows how much you've got. He just wants to know where you place it. So even the smallest amount, if it's placed on Christ, if you're trusting only in him, then you will have eternal life. You know, so she said, I believe and called upon the Lord. I didn't even know that was a stumbling block for some people until this came up. But apparently that's something that they even think about is they think they need a lot of faith on the Lord, but they don't. They just need to place it in the right place. And she was humble, even to the point she knew she didn't have much faith. But it's not about the amount. It's about where you place it. And the same goes for everything, even after salvation. But you can see how pride gets in the way um, of faith and how it destroys your faith. Um, But for us here who have already believed on the Lord, um, it's not so much of an issue. So now I want to see how it can affect our, our faith in our daily lives. So one thing's about how, uh, how God provides for us. So we've seen, uh, for context here, Jesus performed the miracles, including the feeding of the 5,000 plus women and children. The disciples are sent off into a ship. Um, and it says, uh, verse 50, For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up into them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. See, we need to understand, God doesn't fail, and he's not limited in his ability. But our lack of faith and trust, or even forgetting what he's done for us before can cause us to miss out on his provision. See, as it says in, uh, in Psalm 37, it says, you know, uh, what verse is it? 24, 25. It says, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. See, I know that promise. I'm not going to be forsaken and I'm not going to be begging bread. Because I know that the Lord will take care of me. 
And God's promised these things. And that's the thing. He did the miracle of the loaves. They forgot that miracle and were worried then about when, he, when they were travelling on the sea. If they'd have remembered the miracle of the loaves, then they wouldn't be worried about food. They wouldn't be worried about rain. And they, wouldn't be worried, they wouldn't be fearful that the storm comes because the Lord's going to take care of it. You know, we just need to trust in Him. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, Psalm 78, I'll actually, I'll get you to turn to Proverbs chapter 3. I'll read to you from Psalm 78, verse 1. It says, uh, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast in God. So that's such an important warning there that all generations should hear the words of God. Um, They should all have a fear of God and trust in him. So it says even the children and their children's children. Like you should continue this down all generations. But we see when a nation or people forget the Lord and the good things the Lord has done, it leads a nation and the people to turn to wickedness. And that's why teaching the whole counsel of God is so important, especially to the youth, especially to the children, so then they can teach it to their children and carry on the tradition of teaching the word of God, reminding them of how good the Lord is and what he's done. And, you know, so we can trust in those things. So you're there in Proverbs 3. It says, trust, in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honour the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. See, the Lord rewards when we trust in him. He provides all our needs if we put his kingdom and his ways first. But it does also go with keeping the commandments and even the chastening of the Lord. In verse 11, says, My, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a son in whom he delighteth. So the Lord delights when we trust in him, when we trust in his judgments and his commandments as being right, even though it means we deserve his chastening when we do wrong. When we step outside his law, it's still for our own good. It's because he loves us. That's why he does it. And we just trust in him that even though he's putting us through some tribulation or whatever, we know we're trusting in him that it's not going to be too harmful for us. We're going to come out better at the end of it. And just always remember Job. Job went through absolutely horrific experience and yet he was better at the end than the beginning so we know that you know even though he didn't deserve it uh, whatever we go through we know we do deserve it and uh, we know the lord's not going to test us further than we can handle so that's again something we need to trust in so don't be afraid when the lord chastens you just receive the correction in proverbs 20 verse 24 it says man's goings are of the lord how can a man then understand his own way so that's why we need to let the Lord guide our steps. It's about trusting him. It's about faith and confidence in him to do as he promised. Whereas pride will say, I can take care of myself. You know, It doesn't mean we sit back and wait for, for free stuff either. But rather God commands us to work, to provide for ourselves and our families. But the Lord provides you the means to do that. He couldn't command you to do that and not provide you with the means. That's not who God is. But he does make sure that you lack nothing if you put him first in everything. And that's what walking in faith is. That's living by faith. See, we do it the Lord's way, according to his understanding. And that requires reading the word and knowing the word so that you can actually do them. 
to uh, Proverbs 21.25. says, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. So this, this is something else the world teaches. Um, you know, if you give liberally, that's contrary to the world's wisdom. But we know if we put the Lord in his kingdom first, we have all, in it, all our necessities. So covetousness was also a wicked sin that God hates when you desire something that doesn't belong to you. Um, I'll, I'll just skip over uh, this story. There's a story here of a woman who had an illness in Mark chapter 5. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of people surrounding Jesus, all, all touching him. Um, but she put her confidence in, uh, in the doctors. And she lost everything in pursuit of a cure, you know. So she had an issue of blood 12 years uh, and spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. So when we turn to the world and look to them for an answer, sometimes it'll just not only make you poor, but also worse. You know, they're not going to help you. They're not always going to be able to help you. In fact, if you go there first, then God may not help you either. But if you go to the Lord first, we see that when her, when her confidence changed from the physicians to the Lord, she touched the Lord and was made whole. And now there's a lot of people touching him, but the only one that was healed was the one who reached out confidently and was healed. So while there were probably hundreds of people touching Christ, uh, only one received the healing, and he turned around and said, who touched me? You know, because he knew that some of, some of his virtue had gone out. And that's why we've got to have confidence in the provision of the Lord. You know, he says, are you not worthy of more than many sparrows? Like, don't you have trust and confidence in the Lord that he can take care of us? Are we so proud that we think we can solve all our problems? You know, we need to give them to God and leave them behind. And that takes a lot of, it does take a lot of faith. It takes a lot of trust and confidence in the Lord. But who better to trust in than the Lord God of heaven? Like, I can't trust in man. I can't trust in anyone on this earth. But there's one God I can trust with everything. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, uh, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall, be kept, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So again, we see that joy and that peace. So we don't be concerned with your problems, but give them to the Lord. Give them to God. And just make them no longer your problems. See, so we trust in Him to care for us, and we know He does. We know He loves His faithful children. It says, He that trusteth in His riches shall fail, shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. That's Proverbs 11.28. And again, we'll get into fear now, which is another aspect of faith that we often fail in. Um, Proverbs 3.25 says, Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Again, if the Lord's my confidence, why would I have fear of anything? Why would anything bother me? Why would anything cause me to fear? Proverbs 29, 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Again, there's no question there. Shall be safe. I trust the Lord that I will be kept safe from my enemies and from, you know, that's why I believe when I die, it's because the Lord wants me to die. I'm not going to die a second before he wants to take me because nobody can do any harm to me except the Lord. Again, why would I fear anything except for the Lord? Because we are commanded to fear the Lord. We'll get to that in a second. But we have a story as well in Mark chapter 4. So I'll just read the first. It says, In the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Jesus said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. In Mark 4.40 it says, And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So Jesus was asleep. We heard this story as well not too long ago. Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat. Um... And Jesus didn't have fear because faith casts out fear. But the men were fearful because they didn't trust in the Lord. It, they had no faith because it was Jesus who said, look, let's take a ship over. If the Lord says, hey, let's go over here, don't you think the Lord's going to make sure you get there? Like, isn't he going to protect you? But again, like with the loaves and the fishes, they forgot. You know, they forgot the Lord and what he'd done for them before. And of course, it led to fear. 
And uh, that's, you know, we must have trust and confidence because as Jesus promised us these things, if he promises eternal life, then it's a done deal. If he promises that we'll never be begging bread, it's a done deal. If he promises that we'll have food and raiment and that we should be content with that, then that's a done deal. So we can, f- we can cast out fear by trusting in God because Jesus wants us to trust him and not to fear men. But if your trust and confidence is in yourself, then yeah, you have everything to fear. I'm not strong enough to fight for myself. I can't defeat my enemies, but the Lord can if I just trust in him because he's so much greater than I am. Um, I just want to turn to Psalm 119, verse 113. I read from Psalm 147, verse 11. It says, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. And in Psalm 119, verse 130, 113, sorry, 113, it says, Samach, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according unto thy word that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. Thou hast trodden down all them that err from thy statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross, therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. So again, fearing man is weakness. Strength is to have confidence and faith in the Lord. So that's why we're so bold when we preach the truth of the Bible. That's why we don't fear when we can go out soul winning. It's because we didn't discover these things for ourselves. It's the word of God and our confidence is in that word. In Proverbs 21.30 it says, There is no wisdom nor understanding nor counsel against the Lord. See, nothing can stand in God's way if he wills it. The Lord is all wisdom, knowledge and understanding. He's got all power and mercy and wrath and grace. So who better to trust in all things but the Lord God who made us? You know, who made, he made this world and everything that's in it. Um, Proverbs 19.23, another promise. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. So that's the thing. Fearing God's a commandment. But if you're afraid of anything else, then uh, it's because of pride. It's because your eyes aren't on God, you're trusting in yourself, and you know you fall short. But you know the Lord can protect you. If you're trusting in his protection, then you have nothing to fear. Um, there are story, other stories like this as well. You've got uh, Jonathan went up and defeated a small garrison with just him and an armor bearer because he had faith in the Lord. He said, look, the Lord can do it with just us two. He trusted in the Lord. David, the same thing. When he stood before Goliath, he said, look, the Lord's already defeated a lion and a bear by my hands. Why can't I defeat this clown? You know, he's going to come and blaspheme the Lord God. He said, let me defeat him. He said, you've done it before. You can do it again. Whereas if you have a rich man, if you want to turn to Haggai, you get a rich man who trusts in himself, who has no confidence in God, and they'll be destroyed. But the Lord will be our strength. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and as an high wall in his own conceit, before destruction the heart of man is haughty, and before honour is humility. See, if we run to the Lord, we know we're safe. But the man who builds the wall with his riches and trusts in that, said he'll be destroyed. So you're there in Haggai. In Haggai 1, starting verse 2, it says, Thus speaketh the Lord God of hosts, saying, The people say the time is not come. The time is that the Lord's house shall be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, therefore saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. And I'll just go down to... Uh, yes, the Lord just speaks about how He's taken everything away with them. They've got bags of, you know, bags of money with holes in them and he's, he's ruined their crops and everything else. And that's the thing, because they built their house before the Lord's house, the Lord didn't, didn't bless them because faith is putting God first. Had they trusted in the Lord and built his temple, 
before they built their own houses. The Lord's like, oh, I've got nowhere to live, and you're all living happily going home to your houses. He said, look, you didn't build my house first, so I'm going to make sure I ruin you until you build my house. Because, and that's the thing, God can do that. If you decide that I'm not going to put my, my finances or I'm not going to put my family or anything, you know, the things that God has said need to be important. Like, we need to make sure that we, we tithe because God's house needs to be taken care of. You know, the pastor needs to be paid, that we need to do things, we're getting painting done, things like that. Like, this, we need to take care of the Lord's house. And tithing is a big part of that. Is if you put that first, then he makes sure that, you know, you've put his ministers first and everyone else for yourself, then he makes sure you have enough. But if you withhold your tithing um, and re- withhold it from God's house, then God just may make sure that you lose everything because he's not going to bless when you're disobedient. And his house does come first. His house is more important than our house. Uh, let me see. So yeah, safety is of the Lord as well. I'll, I'll go to Psalm 118. Uh, you, sorry, you go to Psalm 33, uh, verse 16. I'll read from Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9. It says, It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. See, the men of this world aren't going to help you either. Your government's not going to help you. Nobody's going to help you, but the Lord, he's going to help you. So we trust in the Lord. We don't put our confidence in men. We don't put our confidence in princes. In Psalm 33, 16, it says, There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his, by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, according as we hope in thee. Again, according as we hope in thee. Lord, be merciful to us as we trust in you. Be our shelter, our strength, our provider, and our saviour. So, Second Kings 18.3 um, says, he, he, He's talking about King Hezekiah. It said, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his, David his father did. Down at verse 6, says, For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the kings of Assyria, and served him not. He smote the Philistines even under Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. And this is the same king who kicked the Sodomites out of the land, broke their houses, and broke their brazen serpent. But he was a great king who trusted the Lord. And as it says, you know, he didn't trust in his horses or in his men. And he had great victory. And he was a great king because he trusted the Lord in everything. So we'll get to the conclusion now. Sorry, it's been a very long sermon. Um, But we have confidence in his salvation. We have confidence in his answering prayer. In 1 John 5.13 it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask. We know that we have petitions that we desire of him. So again, we ask according to God's will. You know, in James it says that ask, you have not because you ask not, and you ask amiss because you're asking for things to lust upon your heart. You're not asking according to the Lord's will. But if we know that if we ask anything of the Lord, that he'll hear us. You don't always get what you want, but he will hear your prayer, and he'll answer one way or another. In 1 Peter 3, verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But And if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, 
they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of good conversation in Christ. See, God protects those who are walking in his ways and they're ready to give an answer of Christ in his resurrection. So you can let them be ashamed of their speech. But if we fear God and keep his commandments, you know, as it says, that's the whole duty of man. We walk in the spirit and we're fulfilling the law as Christ fulfilled it for us. Um, Proverbs 23, 17 says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. See, our expectation is the judgment. So they're going to be found guilty on that day, so that's why we don't envy them. Because they're going to be found falling short, and they're actually going to go straight down to hell. But we have our, our expectation is in the Lord, and we fear him, and we're found guiltless because we have the righteousness of Christ. Proverbs 20, verse 22 says, Say not there are recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. See, this is why we don't have to, we believe in the Lord's judgment, so we don't have to take vengeance for ourselves. We know that it belongs unto the Lord, and he will repay. I read from Psalm 37, just a few verses here, 1 to 3. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. And uh, verse 35 to 40 it says, I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Like we can see that today as well through our governments, through through corporations, through everything. It says, Yet he passed away, lo, and he was not. Yet I sought him, but could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. So we're going to have our peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. But salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. Is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Again, what a great promise. I don't need to worry about what our wicked government's doing because I know the Lord's got it all in hand. And I know they're going to be cut off. They're going to be destroyed. They'll be cast into the pit of fire. So they're going to have to face the Lord one day and he's not going to be as merciful. He doesn't have any mercy for the wicked. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6, it says, therefore, we're always confident, knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labour, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, we have confidence in, as well in the word. So, in English, the Word of God, that's the King James Bible. That's our Word of God. That's ev got everything in it that God wanted us to have. In uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 19, it says, We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private, in private interpretation, for this prophecy came not in old time, by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See, and this is the man that saw the transfiguration of Christ. And he says, even though I saw the transfiguration of Christ, he saw the resurrection, he's seen everything. He says, but what I have here is more sure than what I saw. And I believe him. I absolutely believe him because I believe the exact same thing. See, why do I believe the Bible? Why do I have unwavering faith? in what the, the book says. See, where is our confidence as believers? Is it in the words of men? It's in the word of God. See, holy, God, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this is that more sure word. It's more sure than anything you can see or experience. And my confidence is in what I read, not what I see. Because that's walking by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. So your eyes and ears and hearts can deceive you, but this word is sure, and I can trust it every single day. It's never going to change. So I'll get you to turn to one last place, back to Psalm 119, verse 81. 
I'll read to you Psalm, Pro, sorry, Proverbs 30, verse 5. It says, Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest they repro- reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. See, God doesn't want us to add to his word. He doesn't want us to take away from his word. In fact, if you're not saved and you do that, you'll become a reprobate. If you add or remove from the word of God and the promises of God, if you, if you mess around with his precious words, which he established before the world began. Psalm 119, verse 81 says, My soul fainteth for, th- for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Again, that's hope, trust, have confidence in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? The proud have dig pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. They persecute me wrongfully, help thou me. They had almost consumed me upon earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Again, David stood faithful, or the author of this stood faithful about that, about the, uh, the words and commandments of God. It says, Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. And that's why we preach Christ and his great salvation. That we trust in him and our hope is in his word and his promises. Our confidence is in God and we can't help but speak the things which we've seen and heard. See, don't let pride destroy your faith. Walk in his ways and, you know, what we all hope for is to be told, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But trust in the Lord and just see how good he really is. So let's pray.